right, guys. Episode four of the Bros Meet Science podcast with myself, Deck underscore Jesus, as you can see by my name now, because I've just ended it. <laughs> Rizwan Hussein and the main man, Hilly Doc. So the topic for today, as we've posted on our social medias, uh, because obviously it's something that I know I'm asked all the time, newbies, experienced guys, new coaches, um, mm is going to be first cycles, not initially just first cycles, obviously, and kind of where you navigate after that. Um, Like I said, I think every single picture we posted up to ask questions, there's some sort of question that ties into this. So I thought it would be a good start just to touch base with everyone, give everyone our opinions, how we map things out, and then kind of go from there. Go on, Hilly, what's your opinion? So I think for me with the first cycle, right, you've got to have two two clear decisions first there is the do you want to use the minimum amount that is as effective and go that route which is the new popular route or do you want to take an amount that will maximize that cycle while still being well known to keep health markers in place so by that i mean for decades and decades your standard first cycle was 500 milligrams of testosterone and if you speak to any pro that you look at the term pro from two or three years ago previous they will all have done that cycle i would have put fucking money on it or a deep ball and something cycle right <clears throat> and there's a very clever guy i always mention called broderick chavez broderick chavez something like that legend American kid yeah he actually posted something that says once you go over three or four hundred milligrams you get some type of benefit and it's some psych, uh, physiological thing that goes on that is of benefit than going under 300 milligrams and there is plenty of studies out there that shows up to 500 milligrams of testosterone has had zero impact on health markers so you're so you've got two trains of thought you've got am i going to inject myself with the least amount possible that will put me above natural that will have no effect on health markers or do i want to take the most amount possible that will have, not the most amount, but an amount that is shown to have the most bang for its buck, because I've still got to stab myself in the leg, that still has no impact on health markers. And, and I think that, you know, there's a real trend at the moment of use as little as possible, use as little as possible. And I have some people coming in the like, start on 200 milligrams of test, but their test's actually a little bit underdosed. And when they've checked the bloods, they've put themselves no further over natural than they already fucking were. And it's like, you're risking an abscess. You're going through stabbing yourself in the leg for absolutely zero purpose. And I very much have this train of thought of if the natural range is 8 to 28 and we know that 150 to 200 milligrams of testosterone might put you at 35 or 40. Why do I want to be taking steroid to be 5% over natural? I like, that, like, like, like and, and I am all about getting as much out of a drug as possible, being healthy, and blah, 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 blah. But I really just think that if you get your natural blood stood and you're at 26, so you've got a good natural test range, you put yourself on 200 milligrams of test a week, you're barely going to see any difference, but you're going to risk shutting your body down. You're going to risk an abscess by stabbing yourself in the ass or whatever. Like, there's a serious lack of common sense there for me, personally. Could be 40 and them all. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And then, yeah. And then I also see people that, that then go, Oh well, I've I've, I've took I've took the dive. I've talked about I've talked to it myself for ages. Yeah, I haven't really noticed much, and I'm like, well, why do you think you're going to notice much? You've only increased your fucking test levels by ten millimol. Like, what what did you think was going to happen? Whereas, when people used to take five hundred milligrams of testosterone, off off you know whatever it is, and I'll, I'll go further on this, but you would see a big impact because you were probably doubling your test levels. You would see big changes, big positives. It would increase motivation, and you would probably and you would. Nine, nine times out of ten, see the same impact on health marks as doing 250. And, and that's the first decision, I think. And that is not me saying one way is better than the other. Everybody is different. And again, then it runs. And I, anybody jump in if I'm off too much here. Because not. then you've got, then you might get someone's blood back and they're only at 12 millimol or 15. So they're at the bottom part of it, right? So then, then, three, then 300 milligrams would double where they're at so then they might see more of a benefit they, they would see more of a benefit and more noticeable so maybe 300 milligrams would be more relevant to them 
So I think it's really about it being individual in the sense of what your blood work says. And then I think it's really individual about saying what the client says or you as a person. Listen, I've decided I'm going to make the move. I do want to take this little as possible and I want to take my time. Or, listen, I've decided I'm going to make the move, but I want to make sure I get the most bang out of my book while I stay healthy. So I think that's where you've got to look in terms of what milligram you're going to take. Then you can start getting a bit more complicated or a bit more clever in the sense of, well, right, I know 500 milligrams, 400 milligrams, that's not going to impact my health at all. So do I want to just take testosterone? Do I want to be a little bit more advanced? Do I want to take tested mass, tested primo? And I personally, for most people, would favour blending a little bit of tested masculine or tested primo. Again, that would be case specific, person specific. If their blood work comes back and they seem to be uh, a bit more estrogen sensitive, then I might favour mast because it's, as we've discussed before, it's, it's got a better uh, estrogen control uh, side effect, so to speak. If someone seems to not be E2 sensitive, then I might go primo. And then, you know, I will play about with the clients as well. So what I've done for about a decade and what I always like to do is potentially start someone on three to five million milligrams of test. Then halfway through the cycle, based on the bloods and what the results they're seeing, is as a change, potentially drop the test down a little bit, but bring in Primo or bring in Masteron, and then see if that ratio, if they respond better to that ratio, and they feel better on that ratio than they did on just test. Because as I continue to say, every step that you take, you should be making notes, you should be learning from so that you can maximise your future cycles. So in that first cycle, that might be 15 or 16 weeks, why just use one drug for the whole period? Why not use test only for the first eight weeks? Get your bloods done, learn from it, make notes. How do you feel? How was your sex drive? How was your performance? Then change it, get your bloods done again. And after that first cycle, you've gathered so much information. You now then know what to do for your sex, for your second cycle. So that's how I would how I like to do it with clients and obviously it's the client's decision and I will explain all of this to the client discuss it with them ask what they want to do you know if a client comes to me and they're like listen honey everybody knows that you are well knowledgeable on drugs on how to do this how to do that I don't just want to pansy about I want to push then that's where I would be trending up to four or five milligrams total so no need to go any higher than that but if I've then got someone that's like listen I want to do it very carefully I want to do it bit by bit then we'll go the other option but for me personally, I just think, do we want to spend ages and ages using the least amount? And you might do, but none of us do. And if you look at anybody that's got any huge amount of tissue that you look at and people aspire to, you can be damn sure they didn't use the lowest fucking dose for the longest possible fucking time. Nobody did. Not but one if person. You, if you check a lot on the old forums, right, <laughs> all these guys who keep um, pushing the low dosage um, protocol, they're all running uh, big cycles. Uh, and they made the base of their progress like that. Um, that's most of the UK guys who are on the um, JP forum. There's no, 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 there's nothing new. Everyone knows. That's where they post their cycles, right? If you look at some of Cuba's old cycles, he's pushing the envelope hard. But that's what made him a fucking pro. So I think it depends as well. I think it depends how competitive are you and how close are you to that pro card and is that pro card going to pay your fucking bills? Because if someone said to me, oh, bro, you know what? It was you might tell a pro if you take three grams. I'll be like, oh, I'm taking the fucking three grams then. Do you know what I mean? I think it depends. Yeah. I think it honestly depends. If money's on the line, then it's a different ball game. Going on that subject, yeah. it, it, and this is, this is not me being catty towards the industry, but it, can anyone think of a notable name that has gone from pushing the envelope switch to the safer model or, or the, the safer model as they like to call it um, and actually seen legitimate notable progress. Like this isn't to slate anyone, but I can't think of a single person off the top of my head where I go, shit, fuck me. They're really doing it. But then the guys that I look up to and aspire to in terms of progress, let's be realistic, are the people that don't follow that safer use protocol. And, I, and I'll throw names out there like who drastically have improved. Neil Curry, Jimmy Tonk, Nave Styles. These are not guys that are running this. And please, this is not me saying the safer use model or protocol isn't a good thing. It's fantastic. But there is just two types of people in what you're trying to do. And if you're generally trying to be or optimize or push it, I just don't think 
there is value in that model. I can't see it. No, and I think again, it just—I think again, it just depends on my initial point of you as an individual. What are you trying to do, and where are you trying to go? So, are you just trying to enhance a little bit about what you're doing, and you want to take your time, and you're not in a rush, and you're not about competing, and you might be in a CrossFit or a study sport or yeah, just yeah. looking good for holidays, or then you, <laughs> or then then you might just you want to be loads bigger or you want to compete. There's so many different written boundaries. But the fact of the matter is, and I, I, and I don't think there is any argument to this, once you were ticking every other box, you are, you, the, more, the more stuff you take, the more progress you will make. And, and there's loads of people that really have loads of boxes they're not ticking, don't get me wrong. Fact. But, and, and what you were saying there, Dick, I haven't seen anybody that has openly admitted to using X amount of drugs and them going up. I've then never seen anybody reduce their dose and still get bigger. Yes, I may have, yes, I've seen people get better where they've refined certain aspects of what they're doing. They've improved the conditioning, they've improved the look, they've, you know, lots of things that may have got better, but I have not seen anybody make drastic improvement from going, well, they were using two or three gram and now they're only using a gram. Just doesn't work that way in my opinion. And unless you were unless you were making loads of mistakes before, but if you were ticking all of the boxes ninety percent of ninety nine percent of the time, and you were up to two or three grams or two grams or fifteen hundred or whatever, you can't like if you then keep it all in boxes and half your dose, you're not. You, I just, I've, 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 it's everything is very much dose dependent once you're ticking all of the boxes, but <clears throat> in sticking to that first cycle, you know, topic, it's I don't believe anybody should ever go over five hundred milligrams at all. I think it should be between three to five hundred milligrams, and then it's just your personal choice of, you know, why, how, how you want to make it up, and what your personal opinion is. For me, I just think there's a real logic of, up until a couple of years ago, that was just your gold standard, no debates, no nothing. Yes, we are, we are, we have more information with us. There is things like the safe cycle design, which I agree with lots of it. So instead of using five hundred milligrams of test. Use 300 milligrams of test and 200 milligrams of mastodon. That is the benefit of that safe cycle design. That is getting more out of that theory. That is what we learned from that. We can take our milligram of drugs and we can make it work better for ourselves. But the fact of the matter is, taking 250 milligrams, barely putting yourself over normal, and I mean, really, do you think that you are going to get much more if you were 30 millimole and you've got the 45 millimole? Yes, there'll be more. And if you were happy to spend a year or two years making just a little bit more progress, then that is absolutely fine. But for a lot of people that are into bodybuilding or into physique enhancement or whatever, they end up taking these small doses and then they go, well, hilly, I ran this 250 milligram of cycle and I must have been, I've had two clients this year, last year. I must have been doing something wrong because I didn't see much. And we got the bloods done. And the stuff might have been a tiny bit underdosed. There were barely 10 points over normal. I'm like, what did you think you were going to see? What the fuck did you think you were going to see there? Two guys, right, yeah? Example. I'm, not, I'm dropping the names. I don't really care, yeah? Cuba's changed his whole entire physique in about a few years, right? Six, seven, eight years. Competing for a long time since the junior days, right? Well, Dr. Dean, who's made about two pounds progress in about six years. That's the perfect example there. Look, I'm not slating, right? Dr. Dean does a safer safer protocol method and minimal dosages, blah, 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 right? He's a great scientist or whatever, but he's not the best bodybuilder. And that's because he's not pushed the gear hard. Obviously, we don't know what he trains like or what his food's like as well, which doesn't help. But I'm just generally going, that's a very good example. And I think a lot of people need to realise as well, like, I always give my clients the analogy of a car, right? You can't just go stage three and leave a lot of your parts on your BMW stock, can you? You've got to upgrade, upgrade things as you go along. And obviously, the higher you tune your car, the bigger the risk. And obviously, but the risk is then you're still going to blow the engine, but you're going to beat everyone as well. So it depends. What's the risk? Do you know what I mean? Does it bother you? If you don't mind blowing up your engine and, you know what I mean, and fucking up your clutch, then cool, bro, carry on. If you don't want to risk that, then don't do it. Or just don't do gear. If you want to be healthy, don't do gear. That's my honest answer. Just don't yeah, do I, I think that ties like really nicely back into like like my perspective on it. And a positive towards the culture in the industry this day and age, and I, and I truly mean this, it's very rare I get questioned these days by someone who wants to start cycles where I've had to say, you have no fucking business touching drugs. 
And what I mean by that, I, people are so exposed to it from a young age on Instagram these days. Like, I, I think a lot of these younger kids who ask these questions are actually setting the correct foundations. Like, they know how to train. They're growing naturally. They're in a position to grow themselves. They know how to eat. So I think we've kind of come away or a long way away from, you know, and they are, they don't still exist. I know you mate Bob down the pub who does like four miller tests in 60 milligram of d before he goes to the pub. They do exist, but not within our circle, if you like. Um, but the, the, the big thing for, for guys, because I know it's a, a common question that is asked is like the, the detriments help. And I think what you just probably need to understand is, um, and I have an addictive personality for all substances. I'm just that guy. Um, <laughs> but realistically, once you go on anabolics and you do surpass that 250, 300 milligram mark that Hilly's talking about, and you, and you do get on the other route, it's highly unlikely you're ever going to go back to being natural again. And, and, that's, and that's not speaking from a permanent health perspective that you need HRT and you're completely going to shut your HP, HPTA down uh, in totality forever. It's just more from the sense of when you see what you're capable of and the progress, that's something you're going to get pretty ta- attached to pretty quickly. So that's kind of the first parameters I set out with anybody who's gone on anabolics. And I've got a couple of young lads who are fucking good bodybuilders that tick more boxes than some pros that I know. They have just embarked on that, going to the dark side. And they're really reaping the, the, the rewards. But I set out with them kind of similar to Hilly does. I don't do the whole 150, 250 milligram of test for the exact same reason, obviously, which is, I think, the majority of the anabolics we see in this day and age are underdosed. So I always circle around that 300 to 350 milligram mark. Um, I introduce that to them just to see how they sit, how it sits, any reactions to the oils, uh, any estrogen related side effects, that sort of stuff. Now, I'll run that almost all the time between eight to 10 weeks. Um, and at that point, I'll then get bloods done. Is very rarely I'll pull them off that down to a true TRT at that point. And then my theory on this, I know it's not common practice, is, and I'm not saying we should be running grams and grams of gear at this stage, but ultimately this is where you can recover the best naturally. So where your hormones can recover the best. So this is where I actually favor, like Hilly said then, to add some compounds in. So I'll either increase the testosterone to that 500 milligram mark and chuck a little bit of Primo in and a little bit of Mast in. And if you... To, to put it in layman's terms so people understand, that's kind of where the cycle begins, if that makes sense. When bloods come back and says they're okay, that for me is like the real push. Like I've kind of tested the waters with them. I've made sure they're sticking to the plan. There's no is- issues with the injections. There's no issue with the diet. There's no issue with the training. And from there, that's kind of where we make the, the initial push for that magical 10, 15 pounds everyone talks about on their first cycle. And I think it's just something you just need to be very aware of. Like, when you do go to that super physiological range for the first time, it, it's the optimal place, if anything, to push it. Like there's not a better time. Like you've had no exposure to it before. Organ function, liver, kidneys, you're gonna have no issues there or you shouldn't have hopefully. So ultimately it's probably the best time to add a couple of compounds in, run that one again, like I said, 14, 16 weeks, get some bloods done. At that point, you can then scope to see if you are one of those genetic anomalies where their blood work doesn't skew. And, and that is something that we know is a genetic component is something we all fucking wish we would we had. And it's what a lot of the African-Americans do in, in the a lot of the top pros and their genetics have is their ability to push drugs and not see the side effects. So I think from there, that's kind of how I would map it out. And then obviously from there, drop back down to a true TRT dose. Obviously what we should have done or what, this person who is doing this should have done is done bloods first to see what their natural level of testosterone is and then use some experience or knowledge to pull yourself back down to that range for that cruise and decide what you want to do from there if you're looking to keep pushing it and growing then i obviously would opt to like we expressed before blasting cruising just makes sense to me there's a lot of hormone disruption by going off coming off come on pct and obviously like we've explained the time frame it actually takes to restore your own hbta is drastically more than people realize so if you want to keep pushing it then i would opt to the basting cruise for a decent 10 12 14 weeks get bloods done and then map out your second cycle from there i think you're on mute riz is you on mute sorry i was eating so i muted myself <laughs> <laughs> my mate richie he asked um, a question right related to this he goes right so there is um i go to the gym and this guy keeps coming up to me and he keeps saying to me oh um what you running, mate? And he goes, told my mate, Richie, he's on low dosages, right? He goes, I wouldn't turn myself off for 300 milligram. 
and 200 prima or whatever because I'll be taking 1.5 grams and he <laughs> this is where the fucking twats like him yeah this twat who's telling this guy this information looks like a wank here yeah? and he's telling a young lad to take 1.5 grams and then saying to him do it for six weeks and come off and then I was thinking you're going to do 1.5 grams for six weeks come off for six weeks and jump back on I go bro you're still on cycle mate yeah yeah, he's he's saying, you know, imagine if you're like a good natty bodybuilder and you do banging 1.5 grams a year. That would be fun to watch. Like, you know, that, though? Current I think, do you know, I think in the past few years, I've seen a lot of naturals go on gear, right? And we're all ex expecting this massive explosion and it just does not happen. And you think, you know what, you should have stayed natural, mate. And you really think, you know what, mate, your genetics are not that good, actually. Well, your response to gear is not what you thought it was. And then, find, they um, often then go on. Sorry, I, I find with those people, it's the ones that don't tick the boxes at all. Like when they're really shit at being natural, but look half decent. When they then go on to the anabolics, which gives them the ability to drill down a little bit and start ticking those boxes. And you use, use that Keon Pearson, if you like. He's a fantastic yeah. example. Like lived on Chipotle every day for four meals a day. Looked absolutely ridiculous, natural. Banged a load of gear in him. Actually started following a diet, and now you've got literally the best bodybuilder on the planet. You know, yeah. I find like they're the the natties that half ass it if you like. Um, and then once they start getting all all the boxes ticked and all the basics now down, that's when you see the fucking freaks come out. Because because sometimes going on gear is is a big psychological boost for people. I find sometimes I've seen clients and mates of mine, <clears throat> they're only ever at seventy five percent, and then you get those that seventy five percent look great. Because they've got good genetics. And then some with some people mentally, because they then know they're taking something, it makes them start ticking every box, like you say. And those are the ones that you tend to see people go boom. And yes, it is because they've got good genetics. And yes, it's because they've got a good response. But it's also because all of a sudden they're like, well, now I'm taking something I really shouldn't be fucking about. I should be doing everything else. And I think a lot of the time that's as much to do like what you're saying, Dick. That's as much to do with that huge jump as anything else. They actually did a, uh, I can't obviously cite the um, study, but I'll try to find it. They did a study where they put these people on um, D-ball, right? Two groups of people. Both groups were given, one was given a placebo, one was given the D-ball. And the funny thing was, both groups' strength went up. And it's just crazy when your mind's in that thing of, right, I'm on a fucking shit in the gear. Yeah. You just do more anyway. And I honestly think, I honestly think that's the main reason why a lot of people, guys, make um, massive progress on their first cycle because they're thinking, bro, I can feel it. I remember my first cycle, lads, D ball and sus, yeah? My mate, put, my mate jabbed me right and I was like, oh, fucking, I can feel it. I couldn't feel fuck all right, but it was all mental. But I had the best session of my life. Yeah, you do a lot of it. Well, placebo is just a real thing, isn't it? Everybody knows that. So, and it's, and like you say, there is a huge psychological thing to it uh, without a shadow of a doubt. But I just think at the moment, what we all I keep, we're all coming back to is there's so much of this, there's so much information out there. Loads of people are in the best spot to be taking stuff like Dex is. And we are seeing loads of people that are already ticking the boxes. And I actually think, and I've seen this, like I said, those people that are already ticking the boxes, they've put so much work in and they are in the best place. They almost end up undercutting themselves because they've then listened to the wrong people that actually, they haven't lived through all of the proper bodybuilding. They haven't been around proper bodybuilders to just speak to other people like them on Instagram or YouTube and they like each other's pictures and all of them are trying to get business by saying, we all take the lowest dose, that's all we've done, we're all super healthy. The fact of the matter is, and like I say, I've been around this for, for up, up, just over 15 years and there is nobody that I can talk to now, I talked to 15 years ago, that was ever taken 250 milligrams of anything for the first cycle, do you know what I mean? And do not get me wrong, uh, Jordan has got a couple of lads that he's posted pictures of at the forum, I believe, at least one or two, uh, that work in his warehouse and they've been using very low doses of stuff and taking every box and they've been making fantastic progress. And, and, you, and, and, and you can do so. I just feel again that for the majority, why on earth would you go through the risk of paying for gear, injecting yourself, shutting your body down because you've then got to spend money to get it back 
go through all of that to make yourself barely over fucking that job. It just has, has always, always blown my mind. And every, I, think, I don't know if it's a big placebo, but I always look back at my first cycle, right? Fair enough, I'm bigger now, whatever, right? Barely, but um, that first cycle was the best cycle I ever did in my fucking life, yeah? I remember taking them Debo's and that, and that sust, yeah? I put on like 25, 30 pounds in like eight weeks, right? I fat, but my strength was through the roof. I was just PB and everything, right? I was doing some big weights for a small guy. I think I pulled like, what? I think I pushed like 55 kilo dumbbells on shoulder press and all these good numbers. And I think that first cycle really does hit the best because you get that first proper feel of it. And then you get used to it, I think. And, and this is what I'm saying where I think all of these people that are so into bodybuilding, right? And they're ticking all of these boxes and they're putting the work in like Dexter, there's loads of them, right? They're missing out on the possible benefits of that first cycle by undershooting it. Yes, we have loads of good information now. So we know that taking Sust and D-Ball is not your best move to do for your first cycle. But instead of using that information and being like, right, well, we know from all of the science and we know from all of this and, and, and adding that common sense factor of, we also know that for a long time, all everybody did about 500 milligrams of total gear. But now we know from this safe cycle design trend, that we can change 500 milligrams of test and do 300 tests and 200 pre 300 tests. Instead of looking at it that, they're listening to people that haven't made a lot of progress or aren't impressive bodybuilders. And they're like, I'll just take 250 milligrams of test. If you go to a doctor in America, the fucker will prescribe you 250 milligrams of test yeah. as your TRT. Why on earth does anybody think that if they try to build their body past what it should be naturally, they should do what some fucking doctor would give a bloke to be normal? Like, use a bit of common sense. And, and the, the other really flawed logic off the back of this, and it's something that gets in my skull and has done from day one, because it's so fucking stupid. So the logic paired with this from a lot of the safe for use guys is kind of like the ceiling logic, is, isn't it? So, like, if you start at 500, where are you going to increase to next? Like, you'll be at two grams a gear then, and then you can't go anywhere and all this sort of nonsense. But, like, it, it's utter bollocks. Like, we've just seen it with JP. He's run 5,000 grams of gear, and now he's running 200 milligram of test, and I appreciate it's restoring old muscle, but there, there's no science to support the fact that if you hit two grams of gear, only two grams of gear is going to work for you from that point onwards. Like, there is no ceiling. Like, that resensitization thing does literally work. Like, you've seen it time and time again. I know a lot of it is muscle memory, but backing down for a longer period of time or not being scared to change a compound up after 10 weeks or chuck a different oral in that sort of stuff. Like all these new exposures work. Like you don't have to stick it a gram or then 1500 milligrams or then two grams. Like you can come back down if you're in the and off season. Back up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're in the off season, you would go Deck, to three, four. Yeah, come on. Deck, Deck, you're, you are a walking example of this at the yeah. moment. Our, our current cycle is no heavier, no higher than our previous off season push yeah. at the start of the year. Yet at the moment, by the time next week comes in, you are not going to be far off your heaviest weight. Yeah, yes, literally. 10, 15 pound. Yeah. But you've also got 10 or 15 pound less fat. I would, actually, I, I would actually argue that you will be at a point within three or four weeks where you are carrying more muscle than ever in a better body composition using the same doses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 100%. Again, again, it, which, which totally proves your point. And that's, that's the fun part of And it's something that I think people miss out is, and it, it's so silly, but it's like the chess of it, isn't it? It's like playing a game of chess. It's like tidying up the other variables like we discussed before. Like, Hilly, you and me know what my drugs are. We will always run those drugs. Nothing's changing from here on out. So it's like tidying up the other areas a little bit better, like backing off volume here and there or changing to a new movement or changing to a different food source or do you see what I mean? Or a bit of insulin, a bit of ancillaries, growth hormone. Maybe I might rob a bank and go get some Incredex next all that sort of stuff but like ultimately the drugs are just part of the structure and you can you can change the other variables to keep improving and it's something yeah. that people are so honed in on it. it's just drugs 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 and i know it's the exciting bit i find it the most exciting bit but like once you've set your the anabolics that you like you kind of know what they're going to be kind of forever then it's up to you if you increase them past sensible stages or you just start mixing other things up and even then you can even go beyond then it's like right well if you're changing your training to something that's really high volume 
would it make then sense to maybe use a different ratio of drugs to, to, to play about with that? Or I mean, look at me, test base is one of the only drugs I've never used, but now I'm using it and it's like, well, I'm impressed with this. I would have not, never touched it before. So there's always stuff that you can build in and build out, but I'm not using any more now than I have done before. Yet I've been up to, I, I've used more than before, yet I've been up to the biggest because we are always learning new things. We are always able to get better. And, and, and the real loss in British bodybuilding as we go back to this, Everybody is so focused on this. You've just got to keep getting fucking stronger with low volume. Where the fact of the matter is, over time, I've now brought in a higher volume with it. Then did it with you, Deck. Other people do it. Other people that have nothing to do with me do it. And they, like Jimmy, Jimmy Tonka was speaking to Jimmy a few months ago. And he'd moved to work with Milos. And he was like, Hilly, I'd have never done this. But you know what it is? I fucking love it. And his body was responding from it. And that's got nothing to do with drugs. That's just a complete change in training after a, after after years and years of doing the same shit. Because yeah. obviously, I'm still using, obviously, as you lot now work with Nathan now. Traitor. I know, before, and I know, I know. Did Listen, that six, I still paid Hilly, so he still has to coach me if I check in. <laughs> He's doing double check-ins still a week. Yeah, and double check-ins. I actually paid him about a week before I fucking left him. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> Other cunts would be like, give me my money back. But you I'm not get it, yeah. I'm I'd, not already spent, I'd already spent that. Exactly. <laughs> bought some growth anyway. <laughs> uh, no, nah, but like my, my cycle right now is um same as before, right? But obviously the test is double and the other compounds are halved. So the total milligrams are the same. Just different ratios. But the volume of training that I've doing now is... um it fucking need that much gear. I need that much gear. Honest to God. I've been training an hour and a half today, yeah? About 40 fucking sets. And I think the training's so different, right? It's a total new, as people say, stimulus, right? It's totally different. I think it brings in different type, different style, different type of look. And I think just having that, keeping the gear pretty much the same, I think and then you play around everything else like you're not saying is key. It's that it's that change in novel stimulus, and this is very much a, a scientific thing that runs through all themes of life. It's creating a novel stimulus to force an adaption, whether that is you know, and and that that is in so many different areas. But doing hitting the same nail with the same fucking hammer all of the time, and 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 we can talk about this with drugs. We can talk about it with training. We can talk about it with all sorts. Doing the same cycle at the same dose over and over again will eventually run its course. But keeping the dose the same and switching up the ratios will create a completely different thing. The same as jiggling how your volume is, or, or you, you know, there's so much to change, and that's why I love bodybuilding, and I always have. I've got, I'm, I'm reasonably clever, but I've got a terribly short attention span, and I just get fucking bored of everything. But within bodybuilding, there is nothing to get bored of, and it is always, it always got me excited, it always keeps me amused, because there is so much shit to take notes of, play about with things. And that's why I've always loved coaching, because not only is there all of that shit to learn for me and experiment with, but then I get to do that with other people and learn what works best for them. And and it's not even a bodybuilding thing. When I, It's why I you know, go so far and specialise in digestion or work with clients with diabetes and stuff, because there's all of these things you can change to learn what will create these novel adaptions, novel stimuluses, what will drive progress for everybody. And that should be the fun part for us all. And if you're not interested in that part and you just want them to follow whoever's popular at the time or whatnot, you won't get very far on, in my opinion. I actually thought, yeah, if you're doing all this volume that I've been doing that I'd actually get weak, right? Or maybe I'm just a bit of a fucking nut job. Um, I've been still hitting everything hard. The first week, obviously, you get used to it, you get used to the new split and the way things work, and it's totally new, right? This second week, mate, I've been doing the same numbers I was doing on, on, on the low volume stuff. I'm thinking, yo, this should be heavy, but I'm still moving it. And I'm thinking, so maybe the volume doesn't really affect the strength. Not it, for some people anyway. It's really funny you said that, Riz, because that was the exact same. And it's because we're absolute fucking meatheads through and through. So like when I change from low volume, one work in set between six to eight reps, one back off set to 10 to 12. <laughs> when Hilly hammered me with volume, which I loved at the mo that given time, and I needed it post-show, because I'm such a meathead, I knew in my head I had the capability of lifting that weight. It was just getting it up to those numbers. And now what's yeah. hilarious is you flip that on its head again now, 
and I'm back down to a mix of low volume and high volume, my low volume numbers have drastically improved to a scary rate. And then my high volumes are also going up as well. So like, even though as much as I preach, like stick, because I can't come away from the fact that the majority of people, they stall progress wise because they get bored. I know that. And I was very fortunate, very early in bodybuilding. I kind of just found what worked for me it just made sense i knew what i was doing and i was so content with my progress i never needed to find a detour away at any point but like for a lot of people once you get to a certain level of muscularity and ability to train you know what you're doing you have no weak body parts really everything's getting decent stimulus i think flipping between those two will just drive progress through and through and i think we see it a lot now don't we the the real blend across all of the big coaches is a true blend of jp style of training with that it's knee everything. loss high volume stuff now and like even like the giant sets are creeping back in now I, the amount of people i've seen doing giant sets over the past like few months is crazy and it's it's, it's what i've never stood with anybody want and don't get me wrong jordan is a prime example of doing the same approach over and over and hammering progress with it his mind works that way he thrives for it and it works but for me what i've always found works best and, I, and it's creating an environment so following that low volume progressive overload approach until there's a point where it's becoming detrimental then switching to not a super high volume whether i'm using my force program with people that's sort of using intensity techniques and it's in the middle then going to a high volume but every time you change to a different stimulus your body has to adapt there's loads of progress there it's working different types of hypertrophy it's stimulating different mechanisms and then coming back to where you were again is a whole new stimulus it's a whole force of adaption and it's these changes in the environment, it's the changes in the stimulus that continue to drive the, the, the progress that you see, in my opinion. As well as, like you say, the psychological mindset of it. You get people where I'm like, I am just sick to the back fucking teeth of logging my shit and, and trying to get one rep. So then you switch it over and it's refreshing. Once that part gets a bit boring, then it's right, you know what it is. I just can't wait to get strong and focus on beating that logbook. And it's that, again, it comes back to what I'm huge on, is that enjoyment that drive to do stuff. And if you are that one person that can just drive the same nail with the same hammer, and that's what you get your kicks off, then that will potentially work, but it will also, at times, end up kicking you in the ass as well, if you're not careful. Like, I, I as you lot know, I did Hilly's Falls when you created it back in the day, right? And I ran that for fucking ages. And that was my favourite, that was my favourite split, because what I would do is I would logbook all the bread and butter stuff, right? When it comes to the pet flies, you know, the quad extensions, I just, you know, I fuck log book and I just go in until I couldn't do no more. That's what I liked. It's, it was that perfect blend. You don't need no fucking book. You don't, don't need to rely on the book. It's just there for about four exercises. And then if you want to do a few extra pec, pec decks or you want to do a few extra isolation, just do it. And you go by a few. I think we've lost that. Um, I think the fun well, is the fun. They lost the fun. You lost the fun, mate. Like now, I go to the gym and I think, you know what? If the fucking program says underhand pull down, I might use the machine. I might use the cable. I might use a different machine. I think you might know just change up a little bit. It's similar anyway. People don't. People don't have the ability. I think I see people sat in the gym right, and they're waiting for the same oh. bit of kit for ages, and I'm like. There's so much detriment there to be sat for 10 or 15 minutes waiting. Your mind focus is gone, your body's cooling down, you're losing stimulus. And I'm just like, if your brain can't work and think, right, well, I can't do that, I'll do this. Or, you know, you should be pumped up to train, not a dead step away from what I'm normally doing. It's fucking nuts to me. And I, I don't want book anymore, but I still know what weights I'm pretty much doing, mate, on all yeah. heavy lifts every week. I still know, right, I've done five plate T-bar, that's my fucking baseline. If we drop underneath that, then I know I'm fucking up somewhere, right? And I think a lot of people think if you don't log book, you just go in and just do fucking pussy ass weight. You don't. You still move fucking load. I just lift as heavy as possible. Like that—that's all I know. I work in plate metrics. It's plates. There's no <laughs> half plates, fives. And I go as heavy as I possibly can, depending on how I'm feeling on that day. And I go as close to failure as possible. And I use my back offset to basically to drive blood in the muscle. Um, but touching on on hilly fours program because th this works well in in the sense of like your training experience so when i did the fours program i couldn't get on with it and i'll explain why there's a logical reason for it number one i didn't have a lot of muscle i hadn't built up the appetite to eat enough food 
and I wasn't using the high enough drugs because we did keep drugs very low for a long period of time. So what happened when I first tried it, and I've said this before, I was training so much, basically, I was flattening myself out through the training session. But now I have a lot more muscle, my basal metabolic rate, if you like, or, or my just maintenance calories are so high, and I'm using ancillaries like storage hormones, anabolics at a higher rate, that sort of stuff. That then gives you the ability to to really hammer the volume in. And I don't care what anyone says. If you if you look at the metrics of drugs, food, and training, it is a scale. If you increase all of those at once, that is building the most muscle. Irrelevant yeah. what anyone says, it don't care if you're higher or low volume, the higher amount of volume at an optimal load with the most amount of food and the most amount of drugs is going to return the most amount of muscle. The the hard part is getting to there. That's yeah. the difficult bit. It's yeah. getting your 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 training wheels off, learning to ride the bike on your own, then pop a wheelie and then start doing stunts, which is banging all the drugs <laughs> yeah. and volume, you know? Yeah. I think it I think low I think the low volume approach is wicked, yeah. I love it. I got I still have loads of clients to do it. I really like it. The whole log book everything, yeah. I do still like it. And sometimes I wish I could go back to it just so I can ego lift and get them numbers up. And it's a good way to drive it. Well, sometimes you go to the gym, man. I'll go gym by myself, and I'm like, fuck. I remember doing a prep right in 2019. I was at Hilly. I got a squat four plates. I'm two weeks out. He goes, what are you doing, you nut job? I goes, now nah, I'm going to do it, mate. i got to hit the logbook numbers. And I've wrapped up my knees. I'm doing fucking four plates for 10 reps. He messaged me. He goes, mate, you've lost the fucking plot. <laughs> but I was like, nah, nah. But if we retain the same strength, I'll be the same. So I said, it, it did work. It did work, man. That's work. It, it, it does work. work. And I think I actually believe the whole low volume stuff and people are going to hate this because I know that they think they're the experienced ones, but I actually think it's for beginners. I think it suits beginners better. Low volume and log booking is more like an introduction to what it takes to go there on sets, learning that having a log book as a metric to push the volume up. And once you become very experienced, that's where you can really freestyle it and start chucking some high volume in some crazy muscle rounds or some intensifiers and that sort of stuff. But I think, I think the low volume is very much for the beginners. And I think over time, which is why everyone says, and the line is bullshit. You don't see any of the top pros doing it. And that's because they have the experience. They know what they're doing. It's not because it doesn't work. It's because they have so much muscle. They use so much drugs and eat so much food. They have the ability to really ramp volume up and push the limits. And then and not just that, there's an add to that as well, is that you, everybody can, once you get so strong, trying to get stronger just equals more injuries, nothing else. And and I, I think Nathan Diasher is a prime current pro. He was like, Phil Heath came and trained with him or he trained and he was like, I can do six plates, six and a half plates, but why would I? But I can just do more sets of four plates or four and a half plates. You know, like, and, and it's, and pros, you don't see them just doing one set because they all would be so strong. They, it, it, they would damage themselves before they made any fucking progress. Yeah. How silly does it get how we, you know what, rack every single yeah. machine for one yeah. set? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But look at Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler said in several videos, he would never use the full stack of a machine, like a psychological thing. He would always do one one peg down, but he'd be doing three or four sets with that. Yeah. One of the biggest people on the planet. There's an add-on to our main topic here. <clears throat> I think what would be good is, and we'll probably disagree, but we'll have different opinions. There's always this thing of, and it's been a few times on Jordan's forum, uh, and, and then privately. After your first cycle, should you PCT or should you move to a cruise? Yeah. So, Deck, you go first. So, and this is where it's difficult because it's the fork in the road. And again, it depends who you are. And I think there are two groups of people. And I think if you are just looking for a minimal increase to what you're already doing. So let's say you're a naturally good looking kid, decent shape, and you go to IP for all the time and you just want to run a small cycle um, or your first cycle just to, to look a little bit aesthetically better. By all means, do that. Like we said, in the same premise as we've just done for your first cycle, no different. And then I would opt to PCT. However, like I said, when you go through that or you go on your first cycle, as we understand fully from a, a scientific background, we do recover at a much faster rate after the first cycle. So I think that actually gives you the ability to jump back to being optimal very quickly in the sense of in a much shorter time frame. Whereas I, if I was to blast now 12, 14, 15 weeks, we're going to do a 10, 12 week cruise. Where at that period of time, because you're going to be running that 300 to 500 milligram test, maybe 200 uh, mass primo, 
you can limit that time frame depending on bloods and effectively get back to growing muscle at a much quicker rate as long as that's what you're trying to do and like i mentioned on my story the other day because everyone loves asking the pro card question and like i never wanted to be a bodybuilder at any point in my life like i just wanted to when you see that guy on the street you go what the fuck is that and and to do that that means more pushing the boundaries than a lot of these guys that want to be bodybuilders which is balance making your physique look pretty making sure all the proportions are right so like that was my direction and i knew i was going down that route from day one i think if you're done that road then i think you should absolutely cruise like i said to a true hrt trt dose based on your first amount of blood pre-cycle which is probably going to be between 100 and 150 mega test realistically um and then from there i would then look to go back on blast again and i would opt to stick to the same amount of testosterone if i'm saying around 500 milligrams and then i would really probably start to look at something like primo at a higher dose and I do love Primo for that reason, specifically due to, we understand, low toxicity, high nitrogen retention, lots of fullness, lots of gains. You feel fucking ace on the stuff. And then I would like to, at that point, is to experiment with an oral, something mild like Anavar at that point. Now, look, we know how it goes. It's very basic stuff, but that's where the oral would come in and then rinse and repeat. You see, I think your first cycle, you do it right. You first, right, so you do your first cycle, you go straight in 500 meters of test, right? And I'm just going by what I've learned from myself, my own experience, right? Throw in a fucking oil straight away, get the full shebang, make some good progress, come off after about 8 to 10 weeks, 100%, don't run blood, just come the fuck off, right? Run a PCT, I think, right, is this the route that I am going to go down for the rest of my fucking life, yeah? And then think, right, a PCT now, am I going to jump back on? If you're back on within eight weeks, and listen, bro, you're better if you're blasting and cruising. Um, there's no point you PCTing because you're just going to be yo-yoing your whole life. It was something I did for a long time. And I did my first cycle for eight weeks, never did another cycle for eight months. And I regret doing that. But I had, I was not, did not have the right people around me at the time to learn. Or I would have blasted and cruised since then. And I think... When you PCT, I think you lose a lot of progress. And a lot of guys who do say they PCT, they're like, oh, I pct for six weeks. And I'm like, when was your last job? Six weeks ago. So you're still on cycle, mate. So I think in the long run, if you're going to constantly keep using, then just stay on a HRT. I think that's the most realistic answer. Like, I think it, it depends what your goal is. If your goal was, like, when I was younger, mate, I watched Rich Piana and I wanted to be like that. So I should have just stayed the fuck on. <laughs> and I should have blasted it hard. But obviously I was misinformed and I, neither was my diet on point. So it was probably the right time to come off. Uh, for me. Need to do. Yeah, for me, I have this thing of, no matter, un, un, unless you've been all into training for a while and you want to compete within the next year or year and a half or, or whatever it is, I generally think that everybody after their first cycle should come off, do a PCT, and purely just because I feel that everybody should learn what it's like to go through a PCT and learn how it is to Very lose good point. gains and, and, and what you need to do to, to try and keep it. So, so, for instance, for me, talking about new challenges, talking about keeping yourself amused, for my first few cycles, I would always come off a PCT for, for, for many of them, and, or I might blast, cruise, blast. And then I would PCT at the end of the year and I would always come off. And I did this for many years, make sure I came off, make sure I was done, make PT here. But for me, one of the very good challenges was learning how to change my training and change things so I didn't lose a lot of strength. So it would be like, right, well, if I've been doing this, what about if I try just doing push-pull legs Monday, Wednesday, Friday? How can I adjust things? And I, I just feel it now. And I think there's a two-fold factor to it. Obviously, in our heads, we would much rather blast and cruise from the get-go because we're all gearheads. We all want to be as big as possible. And there is no doubt that's how you're making the most progress. I also think there are a lot of coaches that would rather let a client blast and cruise so they can continuously make progress. They'll keep the client because the client is happy to keep making gains because fact of the matter is coming off source. And you've got to learn what it feels like to be off low testosterone, what it feels like to be shitty, lose some gains, lose some fullness. I just have always had this thing, and I, and I keep repeating it to people, is 
Your first cycle will be impressive. Should be awesome. But I just think everybody should at least once or twice run through the process of coming off, knowing what it feels like, learning how to try and keep the gains. Because the fact is, if for most of us, the longer that you are on Blast and Cruise, the harder it will be to recover your HPT access. And like myself, which I've said before, mine didn't recover when we tried for a baby. So I will be on HRT forever, which I'm completely fine with. But for the first several years of me using it, I did come off at least once a year, and I made sure I recovered. Then I blasted and cruised for five, six, seven years. Five or six, whenever it was. And I'm 36. But now I see loads of lads. 19, 20, 21. Blasted and cruising. Now that means, right, say, I use myself as an example, if it meant blasting and cruising for five or six years before I couldn't potentially recover, these kids are going to be 25 or 26 before they can fucking recover. You know, so I just think, for one, it should be a learning curve. Learn to fucking come off. Learn to train natural. Learn to do what it takes to hold on. And then also it might longevitize, is that a term? I don't know. But again, there is, and again, it's always person specific. If I've got someone that's 21 that's been at it for a long time, and they're like, hey, I want to compete next year, I want to make the utmost progress, then yes, blasting and cruising is optimal. But I just feel everybody should get, and, and it might be just because I'm getting fucking old. No, I agree with you, mate. Think, I just think everybody should maybe get one or two PCTs under the belt and really have a clear out. And I mean, like you said, Liz, Nath, Nathan, who you're working with now, who's coached some of the best people in the world, he said he believes in people coming off. And it is one thing that is repeated by a lot of top guys. You hear them say they like people to come off, they like to come off. And everybody else is like, nah, we don't believe it. But I do just think there is merit in at least going through the process instead of blasting and cruising for three years and it being a really much harder thing to go through when you have no clue what it's like. I think, I think... But just so everyone knows, I was not always blasting and cruising. That only happened recently, right? Um, and you'd have me come off every fucking Christmas. You'd be like, right, mate, time to come off. I'd be like, don't worry. Like, yeah, you are. Did you come off me? You're running a full, full PCT, and I'd be like, fuck it, and just do what I'm told, right? We did that like four times really for like four years. And I used to have this thing where I liked people to go on early on in the year, blast and cruise during the year, and, and my thought pattern was shows are done November, end of season. At Christmas time, it's all right to get a bit fluffy because this would be my joke. You wear jumpers, you wear polo necks, you know, you're not in tight tops, you're not going on holiday. So you can come off, you can get softer, you can have a two month, you can have a three month clear out, November, December, January, and then you can go hell and let them blast and cruise February onwards. Repeat the process. Nah, I, I like to be fully gl- blown for Christmas Day, just so my nan's like, <laughs> what the fuck have you done? Every year, she's like, what do you look like? Stop it, you look like an idiot. That's not my favourite game of the year. It's like the Christmas yeah. classic. Fuck two bros. I just try and piss my nan off. <laughs> um, I, but going back to that point, Hilly, I, I think that's a fantastic point in, in Extremely Overlooked. And in the other side of that, um, and, and I'll mention it because it was probably the most fun I've had in bodybuilding in the past like four years was our last downtime where I ran a full, full fertility cycle. Um, the, the aim of that from start to finish was for me was to prove a point that like I would look the same by the end of it. And I fucking, I was drier, leaner. At, granted, I was a little bit so, um, less full, but like my body composition didn't slip. I didn't drop any numbers. I reduced volume. And I think you are absolutely right. People de- do need to understand that you can't be Superman 365 days a year. And there is a level of enjoyment in it. And I think a lot of the bigger guys, and I think Dan mentioned on our last podcast, we understand that as you get a bit bigger, and a bit heavier and you start using multiple compounds at higher dosages it's almost like a balancing act of toxicity which is the fun part isn't it because as you know when you get to that cruise dose sometimes you feel fucking awesome because you don't realize how quick that toxicity builds you go on cruise and all of a sudden training's better digestion's better your sleep's better you just feel on top of the world even though blood looks good and that sort of stuff it's it's a very valid point Hilly. so i think that's a good one mate that's something that i actually want to talk about today right me and ed spoke about this recently and we had just, you know, normal bodybuilding discussion like we do in person, right? And the topic that come up was, well, a lot of bodybuilders, we're, I think we're all quite guilty of this, right? Is, oh, yeah, um, let's run a cycle, fuck up the bloods, and then you basically, you just wait for them to get back to normal, you just hammer them again. And I think, I think that's a bit wrong, to be honest, when you think about it realistically, it's not healthy either. 
I think a lot of people think that's if you do that, you're long, you've got longevity, but I don't think you have. If you take a big step back, you're basically saying, right, man, I'm going to fuck myself up, come off a little bit. I'm going to fuck myself up again, come off a little bit. There's only X amount of time you can do that until your numbers really fuck up. And neither do blood show your um, what's happening inside your heart, right? Or what's physically happening inside your kidney or whatever. And I think when I spoke to that Imran from the blood clinic, right? He was like, a lot of bodybuilders don't die from the fucking liver, it's the fucking kidney. And he goes, where the kidney goes, the heart tends to go, they tend to go together. Which was a really interesting point, because I was like, oh, my, my livers are good. He goes, but that doesn't matter. Because it's all about the kidney, he goes. So it's quite interesting topic. It's I the think. blood pressure. I, I think I think it's the blood pressure, isn't it? Like, the blood pressure is the one that puts the pressure on the kidneys, which then has a, a backward yeah. effect on your heart. And I think... I think the biggie, which, which which we all know is a silent one, look, and I can say we're as preventative as possible, is the heart. Like, you can do fuck all with it. Unless you're paying thousands of pounds in the UK for private um, uh, heart scanning and so on and, and all these sort of things that they were doing at Liverpool University recently, there's nothing you can do. But, like, go back to what you said, um, Riz, th this isn't a game of health. Like, we can play longevity and we can say the yeah, word, yeah, yeah. but it goes back to your analogy about the car. Like, I don't want to be driving a... BMW 120R, like I'm driving an M4, like that's literally <laughs> that, and ultimately is there's a risk with that, and it's something you just have to be man enough and responsible enough to to kind of deal with the consequences if they come. Look at Marcus Rule, 590 pound his old fucking life, smokes 20 cigarettes a day, and he walks around healthier than a lot of guys. Um, it's 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 a game of chance. You're paying Russian roulette. That's that. yeah. I think a lot of people as well. I think what they say is, oh, but gear kills people. Yeah. You should all stop doing it. Because there was a few heart attacks last year, probably COVID-related. 100% um, COVID-related. Myocarditis, guaranteed. <laughs> a lot of people died in last year, right? God bless them, right? Luke, all these people, whatever happened, right? They've gone, right? A lot of people had heart attacks and they're still alive now. But the thing is, my auntie had a car crash, yeah? I don't mean I'm going to stop driving my fucking car. Do you know what I mean? It's, I think people, they then panic and worry and I think that often causes a lot more issues than people talk about as well. Just stressing. I think stress destroys people. On um, on the note of the, the, the main topic, guys, it's something I wanted to caveat off the back of it. So for both of you, really, what were your first cycles in totality, length of time and compounds, if you can remember? Um, and I suppose <laughs> the other side of that would be... What was your favorite? What was the what was the most significant cycle you've done? Like what what was the one that kind of thought, oh this was fucking good? Everyone's got one of those in their their mind. Riz, you want to kick off? So my first cycle when I was actually young, man, me and my mate Viv were going to have a little competition just in the gym. Right? We did what? This was not bodybuilding, right? It's just about who can get ripped. So I got some Alpha Pharma Rexabol, right? Fifty milligrams. Rexabol. Yeah, Rexabol. These are old school fifty milligram winnies, yeah. And uh, they were wicked. So I took one of them a day for like eight weeks. And I was quite a fuck, fucking dry and I got strong as well. But I never felt that proper anabolic push inside of the system, the D-Bowl. And that's when I found out what gear was, yeah. It wasn't nice. It was sweating. I used to get nosebleed. I didn't know what was happening. That was a wicked cycle. But I'd say up until recently... The best cycle I've ever done, and I will never change, you know, is test EQ, MPP, and a little bit of oxy. That's the perfect cycle for me. It's taken me a long time to find the perfect balance without getting any fucking gyno as well, so it's brilliant. Uh, my first cycle was, uh, forgot, obviously, a long time ago. Uh, and I wasn't really, I was training hard and, and a good four or five days a week, but my nutrition was shit. Uh, a mate of mine got me, me and my mate decided to do it. I think we just left college, so we'd have been maybe 18. Uh, and it was a Miller test and a Miller Decker, I think. And to be honest, it probably was thick and it didn't do much. And in terms of best cycles, I don't think I get that much of a, an impressive response from any drugs, me, if I'm honest. I, I, when I go on cycle, I never balloon up a ridiculous amount. My strength never goes through the roof. And I can't pinpoint where it ever has done. The only time I've really done something where everybody else and I was like, that's naughty, that it was a long time ago when I was, uh, I was a member of uh, this private forum and I, I was running, if I remember rightly, I was running a high test cycle 
all the, there were all the blokes on this private form and they were like, just run two grammar tests, Ali, two grammar tests, great. So I said I was going to run two grammar tests, which I did. And then at the time, so do you know Scott Francis? Yeah, yeah. So he used to go, he, he used to have a username on YouTube. Scott. So called, yeah. And he used to post loads of bad shit. But some of it was interesting. Anyway, he, he pulled this thing off someone else that was called a growth hormone blast. Right? I saw this. I remember reading this. Yeah, right. So I was like, right, I'll tell you what it is, I'm going to do that. And what, what it was was if I remember rightly, he would take your monthly dosage and do it over one week. And his theory that he got off someone else was you were almost mimicking a growth spurt as a child. So you would take your month's worth, and I think what it was was it was 5 IU the first day, 10 IU, 15 IU, 20 IU. It was like 100 IU over like five or seven days. And, and you would do that for a week, do three weeks off, do it again. So I was running this two grammar test and I must, have, I must have been on the second growth hormone blast. And I remember being stood in my mum's kitchen in, with no top on, with shorts on. And I heard someone drop something and my mum had walked in and my mum went, what the fuck have you been doing? And I was just like, <laughs> yes. Sleeping on yes. all the growth. I was like, yes. But that was, that was when everybody was like, what the fuck have you been doing? And I was just, obviously most of it was water and whatnot. But it was just a comical, fun look. But it was not healthy at all. But those growth blasts were interesting because me being a geek, I was documenting everything. And you did. When all the fluid dropped off, you were holding so much of what was put on. And like, at the time, no one was banging the science and shit. So you wouldn't get loads of little stupid geeks going around going. Like, two of the two two guys who I was very good friends with, who were some of the most well-known people in bodybuilding in terms of uh, anabolic suppliers, making the biggest labs, the most well-known at shows. They were retired from bodybuilding or whatever, and they went to partying. These guys had growth hormone cycles written up just for going partying on a weekend and stuff. And they were like, just do this, just do that. But yeah, that was the uh, that was the most drastic visual effect I've ever seen from anything. The most what about fun... that? <laughs> I just remember reading the Dutch got post. I, I, obviously, I was, my, my like initial let's just say foot in the door at a gym was it ministry of fitness where, where scott trained and now i just remember seeing this and now it's hilarious now because back then to me he was like the pinnacle and then you look back now and you realize that the cunt never had a back or chest he never would have won a bodybuilding <laughs> show if you paid him but his arms were 75 yeah. inches around you know <laughs> yeah. um so, so funny story with me this only came to like fruition about 10 years later so my i'll go on to my actual first cycle but back in the day when i was a, a young whippersnapper about 15 16 my brother was older than me and was going to the gym. So I would go to the gym on his like membership and cycle with my friends. And he had like a pot in his bedroom of creatine capsules. So I would sneak in there and take one thinking it would like make me really big. Just go to the gym. I didn't work this out until about five, six, seven years later. Then what I was actually taking about three times a week, if I could get away with it, was Dynabol. So he put Dynabol in this pot and I was going in there. It just pop in one and go into the gym. No wonder I had daft triceps and biceps as a fucking fifteen year old kid. But um, okay. my actual first cycle was like it was it was very much the basic because I did it myself first. So I wasn't with a coach. I did two hundred and fifty mega test for eight for ten we eight weeks, and then I joined with SAS. And then I was like, I'm going to come off now because I'm coming up to 10 weeks. And he was like, no, you're fucking not. So he was like, you're at 250 mega test. He was like, that's going to go to 450 from now. Uh, and then we're going to put NPP in it, 300, I think it was. We ran that for about another six to eight weeks. Um, and then towards the end, he put some EQ in. And like I said to Riz, just before you joined, Hilly, like I went from like 180 pounds skinny fat to 260 pounds of walrus in like my first push up and Sass thought it was hilarious just to keep making me fat. So it was a lot of body weight and my my head was the size of a fucking moon. I was having nosebleeds every ten minutes. But um that was my first cycle. And then obviously I did the, the standard process of dropping down. I actually I PCT'd. I did PCT, came off, um and then I joined with Hilly back on cycle and then and, and like I said, it, it goes back to like the fertility thing you said, Hilly. Miles on the clock is very important in this game. I started it very old. So, like, I, I've only got four or five years on the clock. So, like, things like fertility, I haven't been hammered for 10, 15 years. So, fortunately, on that side of it, it was okay for me. But cycle-wise, the, the most notable the most notable thing for me, there were there are a few, but I, I would say it was 
Number one, because I have skinny white wood genetics and I don't hold fullness, is when we put Lantis in for the first time, it was a fucking joke. Like, I had never looked or held fullness in a muscle or glycogen in a muscle like I did at that point. So I would say it was when we got up to a grammar test and it was the first time we were push- pushing higher doses of Lantus frequently um, with Primo. I was like, what the fuck is happening, man? I was just chucking up most musculars every day for banter and just getting 9 million <laughs> likes on Instagram. <laughs> It's just weird. Yeah. I just wish I could keep them. But um, it's funny, though, over time, the whole thing's changed because I've never been able to do that. And I used to think it was my genetics. And because you're arrogant, it was actually because I just didn't have enough muscle. And I said to Hilly on my last check-in, I haven't had any GH in for two weeks now. And how full and round I am now is still, it's ridiculous. So it's just more of a time thing. Like, we can say our genetics are an excuse, but it's muscle maturity. It's being able to drive the, the food into the muscle and then store it there, I think, which just gets better over time. But I think a lot of us guys in the circle, right, and in Instagram, a lot of the lads who say they've got shit genetics, I think most of them have actually got quite good genetics, right? That's why we keep doing it. I've seen dog shit genetics, right, yeah? And then people don't last long. They just quit because their body just does not respond. And I think, I always say I've got shit genetics, right? You definitely but do. I know that, but I know that actually not that bad. I've done no. 50% my whole fucking life, yeah? I've not been a bad bodybuilder, 50 fucking percent. And then I clicked him the other day, I was like, you're a miles of fucking 100 percent, try it in it at least. Do you want me once? But I think a lot of people like to throw that word, I've got shit genetics. They've not a lot of people have mega genetics. Some very good genetics. Like if you look at Ed Oldfield, right? Yeah, Ed Hilly, you can't lie. The motherfucker on the upper half. Round. Yeah, upper delt shoulder is ridiculous. Honest to God, that motherfucker could stand with a lot of pros on the upper half, right? I'm not cussing you, Ed, bruv. And he'll say himself his legs. And he's Edward's saying you got shit legs, bro. I'm just gonna throw it out there. That's what he's saying. Ed would say, <laughs> he'd say to me, Riz, my legs are shit, yeah. I'd train with the motherfucker, the guy's legs were massive. It's the fact his upper half so big, yeah. It just doesn't match. Do you get what I mean? It's do you find me I think legs? And it, the more obviously I I, I analyze bodybuilding because I'm just fixated with it. I, I believe like legs genetically or a shape thing like you can have massive legs but if you have that square vmo teardrop and a square sweep like nick walker is an example no matter what happens or how big they get they're never going to look nice compared to an upper body unless you have that that round sweepy quad you know like my <laughs> legs are not that big right but in pictures here you say your legs are the best mate the best body part you got and it's because the way they attach to my hip right yeah. and my waist is so small they just go Pop off. Look like how they're doing rounds, yeah. but they're not even yeah. that fucking big. Yeah, like that shape, shape dictates everything. Yeah, everything. It's all about the shape, man. Did we have some other fire through questions to get through? Joe, well, Joe, uh, one of a client of mine asked a question. You both can answer it. Because I think it's good when you lot answer to answer other people's questions, right? Because I know him quite well. It does tie in quite well with um, what we've been talking about today. He goes... Question for the next episode. What factors do you consider before you have, before you believe a client is ready to, to begin their first cycle? There must be a times clients come to you and do it, but you know it's not the right time. I presume the dickheads fuck off and take it anyway. That's very true. They do, like myself. But I guess what you're trying to say is, when is I think the question made, when is the right time? <laughs> I feel like I'm a good judge of character with this. And like, I I am also the guy that knows that people are going to fuck off and take it because I I can be like that at times. So I'll always give them a stern word. And like I posted on Instagram the other day, like, and and I love training and please leave me alone during my working sets. But I'm always open for a question at any point, if it's in the street or in the gym, whatever that may be, to steer you in the right direction with that stuff. Or I'll do my best to based on my experience. But like I said, I like to see, in my opinion, someone who has built a decent base of muscle, but the other variable of that, which I actually believe is more important than any of it, is the ability to diet down to a low body fat percentage. And I think what that does is that sets a precedent and that person can follow a plan. Because genetically, people can, we've seen it, just build muscle without having a fucking clue what they're doing in the gym. Like they just have the ability to build and hold muscle. It's very, very rare you see someone who walks around pilled at all times with bad eating habits, unless you're like Nathan Diasha, but it, it doesn't happen. So I think 
if, if you're someone who can show me as a client that you have the ability to stick to a diet more than anything, check in on time more than anything, repeatedly, none of this, I've had an argument with my girlfriend, so I did an eighth of booter in a bottle of Jack Daniels every other weekend, or I don't know, I'm going on holiday with a lad, so I'm not doing anything for two weeks and this sort of stuff. Um, I yeah, think it's yeah. just someone just shows that they can just follow a plan. I think at that point, it becomes very apparent that they're probably suited to, to, to jump on it. You know, I don't think you can, you can't go based off someone's like weight that they lift, how good they look, all that sort of stuff. It's more like the things that make up how good they are of a client. Yeah, I don't, I agree. I don't think that someone's physique just really dictate whether they should be on and shouldn't be on because you've got two trains of thought. You've got someone might not have the physique they want, like they, the physique that I feel should be taken gear, but they may have been working hard or they may just decide, listen, all of a sudden I've decided that what I've, what I've been doing isn't working. I'm not happy. I want to look better, feel a bit shitty. I want you to tell me exactly what to do. I will tick all of the boxes. I will follow the meal plan. I will train my ass off and I want to speed up the process. So for me, I would just, I think someone is ready. So not, not being a client or not, I think someone is ready to take drugs when they are already following a meal plan, when they are already adhering to getting their meals in, when they are training, when they are putting training and nutrition above most of the things so i think when somebody is is all is willing to get the meals in when they're working hard if they then want to speed up the process i don't have an issue with them speeding up the process what i would not like to see is when someone is like well i'm missing meals or i'm doing this so then they're using the gear as a coach and in truth i did that for my first few cycles well, and, and yeah, yeah, because you can you can take steroids and then not tick all of the boxes, only be 75% still to make progress. Whereas if you were 100% or 95%, and then added, you'd see even more progress. Whereas some people just want to take it to make up a lack of effort. So for me, I think as long as people are putting all of the effort in, then I have no harm with, the, no, no harm with anybody using it, to be honest. As a guy at my gym, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's in good shape, right? He's in pretty good nick if you looked at him from fighting yeah this guy trains and trains serious you know what i mean if you first met him you think, yeah, he definitely trains hard he must eat a good diet eat a good plan right spoke to the guy and he goes yeah man we're in trend for like about a year and i was like what the fuck and i was like bro what do you mean one year he goes yeah yeah you know the long acting one isn't it? it's lower dose i'm like how much he goes oh bro i use about four mil a week and i was thinking what the fuck and he goes, you know, I can eat anything I like on this. But often the people who say I can eat anything don't really eat much anyway. That's a fact. That's a fact. So I reckon this guy's been taking the gear right. This obviously trend and whatever else he's doing. And it's just filling all them little fucking gaps. Trains like wank, yeah? And he's got an aura of physique. So it does show you the power of gear. And a lot of studies do actually show you can actually run gear and do fuck all. And you'll put on about seven percent muscle, so it does work. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I agree with that. But I also think that those, like people, that those people are the ones that, if you get them to drill down, they're the ones that have the ability. Like Samson Dowder, like they're the ones that over like three to five years can go from looking like an average dude in the gym to looking like a top tier Olympian. You know, like they are those genetics, like they're that elite. I think as well, Deck, like. A lot of people don't see, um, a lot of the bodybuilders who make a lot of progress, right? People see all the Instagram, they see all the posts, they think it's very easy. But as we all know, a lot of these fucking guys, they literally will sleep 10 hours a fucking day, have three fucking naps, what I'm trying to do right now, and they'll just slam the gear and train as much as they possibly can. And you are going to grow when your whole life is literally based around bodybuilding. I you know what I mean? Am I the weird one here? Like, I think that can be counterproductive. Like, I live a pretty fucking nuts life. Like, my, my career is, is spastic. I, I manage the best part of 400 people a day at any given time. But, like, if I was to come away from that, I feel like I would lose my structure. Like, like I would... I sounds really cheesy, but I suppose I'd lose my identity. Like, I have a very good, like pathway out of work life to gym life which gives me the ability to segment the two and i give my all to the gym out of those hours and my all to work within those hours and then the meal t 
time in and eating is just part of my daily structure, you know? I think if I was sat around all day, I'd probably move less, wouldn't get my meals in as much. I think it would be difficult, you know? I'm the same. I could never be just 100% bodybuilding. I, I would lose. I need to have other things going on to coincide, like what you're saying, to coincide with each other. So I have that going on, I have that going on. I would never just want to do one thing and one thing only. You know, all my total goal is to just get up, get meals in. And I would end up being very lazy and counterproductive. For you, but it, I think it really does work. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm not saying sit home, do fuck all, still work something that you can write. But I think a lot of these guys who make the series, like Rich Piano always spoke about it. Yeah, God bless him, right? He's still a big fucking guy. Still on a very, very good show. Very good physique before he went a bit mental. But he always said it. He goes, I train twice a day. I sleep between the both sessions of training. I'd eat 16 fucking meals and the guy grew. Yeah. So it does work. It's just whether you want to live like a fucking... Yeah, it couldn't be It's asked. a nasty, nasty lifestyle, mate. I think it can be like an almost a recipe for like paralysis by analysis, especially for these like young whippersnappers you see that are Instagram gurus at the moment. Like I, I, I won't mention any names, but like I follow people for four years who literally have made the best part of five pounds progress in four years. And they are don't have jobs they coach all the time and they're extremely successful and good at it this isn't a knock on them but i think that when you have so much time it, it, it just consumes you that you start questioning things trying a new training split new diet new anabolics new coach all this sort of stuff and i just i just don't think it works out in the long run yeah i've got a, a question of someone i said to you is that we'll cover here before we knock off if you've already if you've already had gino or if you have existing gino is it still okay to go on a mild course? What should you take if you want to cycle? Uh, would it get bigger and then reduce uh, after the course? Do you boys want to go? Do you want me to answer first? Uh, I'll, I'll answer first. Go. I've got a client who's coming quite right now, right? Big guy now. So a client's called to me with quite a big... Name? <laughs> I'm not, I can't say his name. <laughs> so I've got a client who's got quite big gyno right and when he first come to me i spotted it he was not on cycle either right and i goes bro that's a bit you know um i goes look um, it is definitely gyno mate. that's not fat and he told me what his past was you know bad coaches bad advice stupid cycles and then he goes want to jump on a cycle and i goes no i goes because that's going to get worse and he was adamant to jump back on the cycle so I was like, right, you are under there, you're fucking paying me, so I've got to help you, right? If that's what you want to do, then the customer's sort of right. And I goes, but look, if anything fucking happens, it's not my fucking problem. I goes, that's down to you, mate. What we have been doing is we've been running Test, Primo, and Mastron. He's got Tamoxifen on hand, and Arimidex on hand, and Kaber on. I've got everything on hand, right, because I'm not fucking it up. And he's growing very, very well. And the guy I know has not increased in size at all. If not, it's gone probably fucking smaller. But we're running the test at 300. The Primo's at 300. And the Master's at 200. So it's a very, very, almost like a very anti-estrogen cycle, right? And it's working great. He's putting size on. The guy is not getting worse. Now, it just, I can't comment on what's going to happen after. But I think that's the only way you can hit it, really. Um... The best, honest, this is the honest, God's honest truth, guys. If you've got a fucking guy and it's bad, get it fucking cut. Just get it taken out. i got a little pea size in my left tit, yeah? That um, luckily me and Hilly counteracted that bad boy quick, yeah? And it's gone down. It's when it's very visible. And if it's visible when you're lean, get it cut out, man. Joe Cross had his cut out. Loads of people have theirs cut out. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's about a grand and a half. I think a lot of people struggle to, to, to tell the difference between like pubertal gyno and gynecomastia from anabolics. And I've had multiple clients where I've looked at it and said, you'll be fine when you're not fat. And, and the other side of this, like I had it as a teenager, definitely not, not from anabolics, not from the d when I was like 12. Not from the d uh, Yeah, I, I had it from when I was a teenager because I was, I was a chunky lad when I was a kid. Um, and through dieting down, just in itself like that went but if it's kind of massive from anabolics obviously you need to pinpoint the two if it's prolactin related or estrogen related that's the two pathways you need to understand what's causing it and what triggers it moderate cycle the best thing you do it from my perspective obviously start extremely lowing and escalate up and it sounds really silly 
but you almost want to get to a point where you are aggra- aggravating it so you know where that level is like what's causing it understand where that is like you said Riz, keep tamoxifen and caber on hand um again you want to use it sparingly if you can but the other side of this and, and i've seen it multiple times um in clients is i won't mention their names because they definitely know who they are i can see when they're lying about their diet for the week by their gyne so what one of them the two of them have it uh one of them is pretty extreme and i can see a flare up from me eating shit processed sugary foods straight away on check-in and i call him out on it and he it. says look you know what you're right yeah i had a burger and a, a dessert here on this day and that sort of stuff so tidying up your eating habits is very important um it just seems to be sugar or processed foods seem to co- i don't know the, the the science behind it hilly may it seems to cause flare-ups but ultimately you can do it and obviously 1500 pound and i'm not digging at you Riz, in this day and age is a lot of money for a, a lot of people in sometimes surgery is and i think surgery isn't isn't necessarily always needed because there are one of the top 10 or top 15 olympians antonio burton has terrible guy now you can see it but when he's pilled on stage obviously it looks very good still so it's not necessarily always needed the surgery um but i would like to escalate drugs up to find out the trigger point and almost probably understand what compounds are causing it and then just stay the fuck away from them forever but if it is a solid hard set lump there is in theory, uh, a oral medication called Rodloxifen at higher dosages, which has the ability to reduce its size, not remove it in totality. It's quite expensive and difficult to get hold of, but it has been shown to reduce the size of, of, of gyno. When I did my first show with Hilly, I had a little bit of gyno, right? And it was a little bit bad. We just, oh, back then, listen, back then it was different, right? And the methods were different. We ran a bit of letters all into the show. The gyno were fucking gone, mate. Gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it never ever came back and we're on another cycle you flared up at night thing is one time we've got a gyno i've not got a fucking gyno i've got a tiny little lump underneath yep. my fucking tit right that flares up and as soon as that flares up i'm like right too much test dropping it down how, how big it has to be to be visible as well is massive that's what people don't understand like the majority of bodybuilders gland will yeah. be bigger than people who don't use anabolics the problem is is when it's visible is when people care and at that point it's the size of a fucking golf ball you know james Holly says, well, he even says it he goes i've got a little fucking pea size in there yeah, yeah. if it's not shown on stage i didn't give a flying fuck what are your thoughts Hilly? i think trying to be direct to this lad's question is if you were if you have cycled on and off and if you were currently off and you still have a big a good sized lump there then you first need to you're more or less yeah, yeah, yeah. and your body composition isn't super lean my first protocol would be to die down to super lean and take nothing if it is still there and if it's a, if it's a hard lump you may have to accept that unless you can cut out the, the majority of drugs that are healthier or safer to use are going to aggravate it to some extent because if it's there when you take it, nothing it's become hard it's become formed it's likely only ever going to get worse and then you don't know if when you cycle, if it gets worse, it then may not even come down to where it was before. <clears throat> now, there may there is still cycling options. You could run anavar only cycles, an oral only cycle that doesn't aromatize. Yes, it's not the in trendy thing or it's not cool, but you can make progress doing so. I know the lad that asked the question doesn't compete, he's really just into getting in shape and going on holidays. So those type of compounds would not make it any worse. But for the rest of us that are into bodybuilding and progressing our physique, if you will always have a lump there year round, you will like, and, and it is a hard formed lump, you know, it's very obvious all of the time, you are probably going to accept that 99% of things that will allow you to make the progress you likely want are going to mean that you're going to need to get it cut out. Or you have to look to try and micromanage it. But my, my counter argument. To, to, to all of the points that you've both made would be the amount of money that you may have to spend on micromanaging it, counteracting things, you know, buying a Riminex, buying lepers or buying the relaxer things. Yeah. Over time over, over time, would it then just be more beneficial to get it cut out? I've had a client I've had a couple of clients get it done in the UK, get it done in Poland. Uh, both successful, both fine, not that expensive. So for me, I would think you've just got to, are you someone that is looking to be in this for a prolonged period of time? Are you looking to make the most progress in terms of building muscle 
uh, whether that's competing or not. If so, it is going to be a constant ball ache for you for a long time. And you're going to have to put a lot of effort in, like Dex says, risk this, to manage it. <clears throat> Where over a prolonged period of time, the expense of that may mean it's worth just getting it cut out and forgetting all about it. My personal opinion would be. We'll go to the surgery now as well, God. And it's it's something that it was raised on throughout the podcast, and it's so true. Like, pay attention who's doing the surgery, because when they do it bad, it looks fucking awful. That little divot where they cut the gland completely away and it almost pulls the bottom of your pec away. Yeah. Um, there's a fantastic bodybuilder on Instagram. His name's Elliot McDermott or something like that. He's a fucking monster of a man. Um, not even a pro yet, but he'll win the Nationals. Um, he had bad guy in it, but his chest was so big, obviously, and that's what Holland's head says. He just get a bigger chest and you won't see it. Um, but his chest was so big, you couldn't really tell. But now he's had it cut off. I, I kind of feel like it takes away from his physique because it's kind of like nipped in the bud. You kind of want to make sure from what I've read that they almost leave a small amount of the gland in there that won't react and not chop yeah. the whole thing out. Yeah, the men leave them. underneath the armpit into the nipple. Did you know that? Oh, no, I didn't. No. Um, I'm sure that the my guy who had it done in um, is it Amsterdam do it as well? Yeah, and he yeah, went, bitches afterwards. <laughs> he's got no scar, and he goes, "Riz, they went under, they went underneath my armpit or around this under the the section underneath the pec, right?" And they took both fully out, and he's oh, nice. His tits look nice. Nice, tits look nice. Yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of people need to realize what a lot of people oh, got fucking gyno. Yeah, it's fat. Yeah. If it's gyno, just so everyone knows, put your hand, put your arm over your head like this, right? And do this. Rub your tit, yeah? And if it's gyno, it will hurt. And if you jump up and down, it will fucking hurt. If it's not hurting, mate, you just get a little bit fat. This is how you know it's gyno. If you do a preacher curl, and it feels like you will be shot in the tit, it's gyno. If it's not, you're fine. You're just fat. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But, and also... I mean, Hilly discussed this years back. He was like, Riz, I used to get gyno when I was younger. As in, not gyno, gyno symptoms, yeah? It's a flare-up, isn't it? Wrong. Yeah. With me, I ran bigger cycles in the past two years, and it's barely, barely flared up. It's only flared up this cycle because we were running the test at 900 mix, which was expected. But I knew as soon as that, I literally had everything on hand, so I knew how to deal with it. But I think a lot of people, when you're younger, your body responds to these drugs differently. And I think with time, it changes. As we all know, your body's never the same. So I think that plays a big part in it as well. Just because we'll, just because you're going at 23, ain't when it's going to happen now. Yeah. Like, comment, and subscribe. There you go. 